Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truin. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. From installing a smart garage door opener to installing a bathroom faucet to removing a tree, The Home Depot believes you can do anything, especially the things we have how-to guides for. Visit homedepot.com for thousands of tips, workshops, and ideas for projects, big and small. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we help a homeowner choose the right colors for the front of the house and also consider replacing the garage doors, which can make a big difference on the front of your home. Also, a few things to know about metal roofing, painting aluminum siding, and painting metal windows. Can you really be successful in painting something like this and make it last? We'll tell you how. Joe, what about that simple solution? I've got a quick way how to protect finished pieces that you're going to lay across a sawhorse by making a sawhorse saddle out of a pool noodle. All right, sawhorse saddle. Can't wait to hear all about that. Let's get started. Joe, you know, one of the things that uh, we're always amazed at, especially recently here, is how expensive some things have gotten. That's right. So that's yeah. where, you know, finding economical ways and efficient ways to do things around the house are important. And, and of course, everybody's looking for their best return on their home improvement dollar investment. Uh, so Joe and I um, have some statistics we want to throw at you here that might surprise you on some things, like the national average to remodel a kitchen. You know, they say it's the heart of the home and Certainly, if you're going to be selling your home anytime soon, you know, the first thing prospective buyers look at is the kitchen. So, yeah, the national average cost to remodel a kitchen is between $11,000 and $42,000, um, with most homeowners spending around $30,000. Now, that's a lot of money. So, okay, what do you get for $30,000? Well, in this case, we're talking about a 200 square foot kitchen with 30 linear feet of semi custom cabinets, quartz countertops very minor layout changes. You're not moving walls or anything like that. All new appliances, but no structural changes. So again, you're not moving walls. So if you're thinking about it and you, you have a budget of about 10,000, you might want to wait because uh, you know the low end is about 11,000. So I think people are often surprised like, wow, so the average is, is around 30,000? That's right, like a yeah. lot of money. You know, there's a lot of ways, though, that you can uh, kind of approach the kitchen in a facelift manner and just kind of, you know, because that's one of the things that influence the look of a kitchen are the surfaces, your floor, your countertop surface area, as well as the face of your cabinet. So doing anything to upgrade any one of those can make a really big difference in the overall look of the kitchen. Yeah, if you just reface the existing cabinets and put in plastic laminate countertops, the average cost is about eight. So right there, if you want to save money, I mean, you're saving 3000 from the lowest cost of a fully remodeled kitchen with quartz countertops, which are probably the most expensive countertops you can get. And you know what? Uh, we did a kitchen renovation recently on the Today's Homeowner television show where we only spent $1,200. Well, what can you possibly do to a 80s style kitchen that would make it look better? Well, first of all, the countertop, as I said, the surface influences the look of that kitchen so much. So we put a stone coating over the whole thing. Only took about three hours. I was amazed at how nice that coating from Deitch Coatings looked. It really did make a difference. Changing the hardware, that's something that you take a piece of hardware off, go to the home center, make sure you're getting one that has the exact same offset and footprint. Changing all of that out makes the cabinets look a little more modern and in this particular renovation the floor was in fantastic shape so we just covered it protected it and cleaned it well afterwards and uh, uh, did a little bit of uh, led lighting on this particular one and it's uh, amazing what you can do if you just want to approach it like that but now if you're looking at your bathroom the national average cost for a full bathroom renovation is between 4500 and 9000 and most homeowners spend around 5500 for 
you know, an average 45 to 50 square foot bathroom if you have the separate tub and shower. Now, a partial renovation of, let's say, a little powder room can run as low as 1600 Again, that's, you know, replacing the fixtures, making doing something to the walls and the floor because generally those areas are really, really small. Now, I'll tell you, for a full bathroom, a full master bathroom with the cutting edge smart home technology, all of these kind of things, might surprise you that that can exceed a hundred thousand dollars. So wow, it's a widespread in there, and of course that can you know run into a lot of money. Another thing we get a lot of calls on Joe is replacement windows, and again a lot of challenges on the supply and demand right now on ordering those windows and when you know weeks and months before you get them. But you know we have some national averages on that cost as well. Yeah, we get those calls this time of year, especially right, Danny, because it's cold outside and people realize that cold air is blowing in and your heating costs are going up so the national average cost to uh, replace windows and here we're talking about 10 vinyl double hung windows with low e glass professionally installed runs between 3500 and 10,500 depending on where you are in the country and most people are paying about seventy five hundred dollars now that actually as opposed to a hundred thousand dollars for a bath <laughs> that actually sounds pretty reasonable to me I mean someone's coming in and replacing 10 windows so you don't have to do anything but get out of the way and $7,500 on average. That seems pretty fair considering, you know, you're going to be making up some of that in just lower heating costs. Now, of course, if you put in a higher end window, a wood window, something like that, the price is going to go up. But th that's just to give you a ballpark idea. And you can get it done for around 3500 again, depending on what part of the country you're in. And I think that's a great example where we would recommend to people to really not do it yourself. Because if you're able to get a window custom made for the opening, and all openings are slightly different, and they're able to remove that existing window, put the new window in, and the only thing you need to do in order to finish that out is a little bit of caulking, that makes a lot of right. sense. And it's amazing what those guys can do. And not only are you saving a little money on your energy bill there, but also it has proven through the real estate um, sales that it will increase the value of your home. Because, you know, you think about an old obsolete window, and then you think of another house similar that has nice brand new windows. You know, it does, you know, sway your decision a good bit. And here we're talking about replacing windows entirely. And often, if you have a window where the sash is the issue, but the window frame is in good shape. You can get sash replacement kits where they actually leave the window frame in place. They just replace the sash and the sash are the parts that move up and down or swing out. That would cut this cost probably by 40%. So again, you know, it sort of depends on the shape of the existing windows. But even if you had to tear out the entire window frame and everything, you're looking at an average cost of about 7,500. And like we do every week here on today's Homeowner Radio, we want to just kind of keep you up to date on some of those real popular projects like that. You can reach out to us anytime by calling the Today's Homeowner Hotline, 800 946 4420, or you can send us an email anytime you wish at todayshomeowner.com slash ask. Right now, we're going to go to South Carolina. Christy's on the line. Christy, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house with these garage doors. I feel like I've done everything but ask the eight ball, and I just <laughs> can't see the answer. Well, I've got an eight ball here. I'll try mine. Go right ahead. <laughs> well, I have a mid-century modern, at least that's what I'm told, and it's got siding and brick. And the fascia, an odd thing is, it's kind of hunter green, which I've never loved the hunter green. And my shutters are hunter green, as is the door and the garage doors. And we recently replaced the roof, which is now brown, and I'm leaning towards brown to paint the front door and the garage door. But one of my neighbors said that I should match the siding. I'm looking at a picture of that, and I can't quite tell that siding looks like a, a kind of a beige or yellow color. It is a beige, and not one of the nice modern beiges either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, certainly brown would go with that. And there's a lot of different browns out there, and a, a lot of uh, more modern colors that are lighter browns that would be you know, suitable to that. Now, are you looking to replace your garage doors or just trying to work the paint out? a little bit better here well they are wood and they're very heavy and i think it's just time in the neighborhood most people just go ahead and replace the doors themselves uh -huh. i don't know how to know if that's necessary you know wooden doors almost have gotten obsolete but if it's still working no need to tear them out of there they aren't working <laughs> oh oh well that's the an springs issue. are not in good shape 
the it goes partially up and comes back down. So it, it is time for new openers. And that's why when they come out, they just say you should just replace the whole shebang because I will need new track and I don't like the spring. So it's one of those things where they just say it's better to just do it all now. Right. Well, if you're going to be replacing the doors and the openers, it's, it is better to do it all at once. And, and if you want to match mid-century modern architecture, they do have mid-century modern garage door designs, which are often characterized by clean geometric lines and very minimalist look. They often have flat panels, not raised panels or recessed panels, or they might have narrow horizontal wood slats, and they have typically don't have any windows, or if they have windows, they're very narrow, or interestingly, either they have really narrow rectangular windows that are stacked all on one end, or they have it's an aluminum frame panel with all glass. So it kind of goes back and forth between either all glass or very little glass. In any case, they do make mid-century modern garage doors if, the, if you want to keep that look and then paint it whatever color you want. As far as the shutters and the fascia that are green, before I painted the house or do anything, I'd just change that part because you could always go back and paint the house, but it'd be a lot of work and expense to paint the entire house at this point. And I know you're not thrilled with the, it's not maybe a very modern beige look, but it's not offensive. It's the green that you have the most problems with. So I would change all the green and then um, take a look at it. You might like it. And if the paint on the siding is fine, then I would leave it. But if your question is, can you find a mid-century modern design in your garage doors? You absolutely can. And that would match the look of the rest of the house. Is the house mid-century modern? It was built in the mid 70s. So I think it's just weird. Yeah, that's a little beyond yeah, mid-century obviously means the 50s, maybe into the 60s. Um, but it doesn't mean you couldn't you could build a house today that has that looks like a mid-century modern, even if it isn't. I'm looking at your house and it's sort of um, I'm not sure what I'd call this, but you could probably get away with mid-century modern it has a relatively low roof pitch and you know the windows on the right side where you have is that a like a sunroom or something? I mean, that's very modern. That's the front door. Okay. Looks like a lot of glass there. Those windows, yes. And and it's dark, which is why I wanted to go with a dark garage door to kind of offset the other side. Because right. my, my neighbor who said match the siding, she said, why do I want my garage door to stand out by making it dark? And I thought it was the opposite. If I do light, that will make it stand out. If you make it lighter than the siding, that's right. I mean, I have a gray, my house is stained gray, dark gray, and we have white trim, and I had new garage doors installed a few years ago, and I painted them white. Right. I mean, you don't see it from the street, so it's a little different than what you have. And it's so much a personal preference on that type of thing, Christy. And uh, my house uh, is a kind of a green color, but I have dark um, stained garage doors. They look really good, and so I wouldn't uh, be concerned about that. But one of the things you can do, there are a lot of visualizers that are available online. And I'm sure a number of the paint companies, as well as the garage door companies, have those available. That all you do is take a picture of your house, download it, and then you can place different garage doors and different colors on your shutters and so forth and kind of like almost photoshopping the look of the house and that'll give you more confidence in choosing the right color and choosing the right garage doors on there because I like to have the fixed glass in my garage door because I like to have that natural light in the garage so that's another option that you have. There. Uh, sadly I have done that. I literally I think I'm down to the eight ball. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> because I have done it it's just I don't know. I'm going to know as soon as they bring them if it's the right thing. And if it's not, it's going to be just, I guess, too bad because they've already told me once they order them, they're mine. Yeah, you have to be careful on that. And one of the things that you can also do is uh, ride around some of the newer neighborhoods and look at some of the garage doors that have been placed here and there. And you'll find one that, that, that strikes you as the one you need for your house because you don't want to sit there holding your breath when they're installing them, hoping that you like it. So just spend a little more time on that. But Christy, thanks for being with us here on today's Home Auto Radio. If we can help you any other way, let us know, and best of luck to you on that project. Thank you so much. Okay, our pleasure. Yeah, it's always hard when you're trying to make those decisions on colors, and right. you know, uh, people struggle with it all the time. You know, and and everybody, you know, how those um, opinions are, are, are thrown around quite a bit. You'll get people that'll tell you, oh, no, 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 you have to do this. Like, there's no other way. But it's really what you like. And so many times, it's just get out and ride around a little bit, get online, and browse through some of the imagery that's out there. And in a case like Christy, where her garage doors are facing the street, those are two big doors, you know, which oh, yeah. make it 
it, you know, really important to pick a, the right paint color. In my case, my garage doors are perpendicular to the street, so you don't really see it till you pull up, mm -hmm. which makes it really easy when I have to snow plow the driveway. You can just push the snow right <laughs> into the woods instead of up against the garage doors. Exactly. Coming up, we're going to uh, kind of help a homeowner out that has discovered something in their attic, and they're trying to figure out what they can do about it because it's causing a little problem with condensation. Kind of a unique situation, but one that maybe you might be facing now or sometime in the future. That's what we do a lot of times here on today's Homeowner Radio, tackle all kinds of issues that you have around your home. And we're going to do that when we come back. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app. How doers get more done. Is your backyard more blah than ah? If so, then you need to enter the Backyard Paradise Contest, brought to you by our friends at Pavestone and Quick Creek. One lucky contestant will win their own luxurious landscape. The Pavestone and Quick Creek pros will design a project just for the winner's home, worth up to $10,000, and help Danny and his team install it. Plus, the whole process will be featured on an episode of Today's Homeowner TV. So get your yard ready for warmer weather. Enter now. Just go to todayshomeowner.com slash backyardparadise. Today's homeowner is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. And welcome back to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show, where it's time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. You know, for most homeowners, a short step ladder is the most commonly used ladder around the house for a variety of projects. So the folks at Gorilla put their focus on designing one that solves all the problems you've ever had with a traditional step ladder. This new five and a half foot ladder features dual platform top steps, giving you three times more step depth than a regular ladder. So you have a safe and comfortable place to complete any work you have there without hurting your feet. Now the removable bucket tray offers a really large accessible work area that's perfect for paint cans or trays, tools, hardware, and any materials that you might need while you're working up on on the ladder and it stores conveniently out of the way when your project is complete. The aluminum construction makes it lightweight yet strong enough for a 300 pound rating and the unique design lets you open and close the ladder with just one hand. Plus even though it's only five and a half foot tall it has the same reach of 10 foot as a standard six foot ladder. So if you'd like to check out this Gorilla dual platform ladder head over to homedepot.com. Can't have too many ladders and one that uh, makes it a little safer only makes a lot of sense there. So. All right, well, let's run to uh, Alabama, and Remy's on the line right now. Hey, welcome to the show, and uh, tell us what's going on around your house. Hi, Joe. Hi, Danny. Danny, before I say anything, I want to tell you, you got some beautiful grandchildren, and I envy you. But with a daughter as beautiful as Chelsea, what would you get but beautiful grandchildren? <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and I agree with you, and I look forward to actually seeing them uh, later today to, to cut up a little bit. Well, give them a hug and kiss from me, because <laughs> so, they're some beautiful children. Thank you so much. And let Remy. me ask you one other thing. Sure. Why are you so stupid to go up and put insulation in an attic with your daughter when it's 100 degrees outside? I well, couldn't figure that uh, well out. We've, we've, we've got to hit those deadlines on our television show, <laughs> so we're fearless. We'll <laughs> Plus, I lost about five pounds uh, during uh, that yeah, exercise. So that, that's always good. <laughs> well, my, my problem is this. I, I bought this house up here uh, about six years ago, and I it did have a shingle roof on it. And the guy that I had inspect the place was former troubleshooter for a metal roofing company and suggested I use metal, which I went with. I looked over the contract just the other day after I talked to your producer, and it says in there, remove all static vents. And I got to thinking, why did they do that, number one? Uh, although the, the guy that inspected the house and recommended the metal roof said, showed me pictures of the shingles with nails coming up out. He said, that shows intense heat in the attic. He said, so you need to get it vented. So I went ahead and had a, an attic, a hole cut in the eave on the, on the one side and, a, and an attic, a fan put in there. But w what happened was, is I went up into the roof because of a leak around one of the boots and 
I saw this 12 by 12 inch by 12 inch cut in the planks because it's not plywood, it's planking up there. And then the underlay is, you can see the underlay and there's condensation dripping on that. And then all of a sudden it all clicked. I thought that moron took all those static vents off and instead of filling those holes in with, I guess, another piece of wood, he just put the underlay over it and then put the metal on top of it. Yeah, that's not the way it's supposed to be because even though the metal will span over, you know, a 12-inch um, space, you still need to have something solid there for the very thing that you're talking about here. And so you're having water condensating then on the underside of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I, I understand. That's correct, Danny. Well, I mean, that makes sense um, that it would because, you know, the differences in temperature between outside and inside is going to allow that. I, I'll tell you, you know, the simplest thing, really and it's unfortunate that you actually have to do it um, behind these roofers but to just take a, a piece of plywood it's probably half inch plywood I would guess it might be three quarter and just cut that 12 inch by 12 inch square and then I, I would take it and you would put it up in place I would always use some construction adhesive to, to kind of hold it up there and then take a two by four and go from rafter to rafter to support it and in a situation like that using screws in your screw guns a lot easier than trying to bang away with a hammer up there and um, that way you you can screw all of that in place, get the support that you need in that little area, and prevent the condensation, that exchange of different temperatures from outside to inside. And um, that'll solve the problem. Again, unfortunate that you have to do it after you've spent all the money on the roof. Yeah, and Danny, one other thing. Uh, I was told that a metal roof was essentially maintenance-free, but when I had a guy come out here to look at the boot and the leak from that, he said, no, no. He says, you got to, because I told him, I said, all these screws on the edge here feel like they're loose. And he said, yeah, you got to go back every so often and tighten all those screws down because the wind gets underneath there and lifts those panels up. And I wasn't told that. Yeah, that doesn't sound right to me. First of all, nothing is no maintenance. We always have to refer to it as low maintenance because you are you're going to paint it and this, that, or the other. But you should not have to touch any of those screws and tighten them or anything. They're not going... I mean, in a rare situation, expansion and contraction might back a screw out. But for the most part, that's not true. It doesn't require a regular retightening of the screws in those kind of well, situations. Well, some are loose along the edge. I noticed that because when I cleaned the gutters out, I've tr tried some with a little wrench, and, and they turned and went down. And then some just free spin, like they're not in the wood at all. Well, that's what I was going to say. A lot of those that are loose just didn't hit something that they it needed to hit, didn't really get into the meat of the wood or whatever it's going into. So maybe a slightly longer screw will prevent you from having to do that over and over. Just make sure you get those that are rated for out, outdoor use because it's going to be right out there in the in the sun and the rain. Right, and they have a rubber gasket on them also. Right, yeah, you might have to get a, a handful of those. Just get them a little bit longer and then try to maybe slant the screw a little bit so that you're getting into some real meat there. And Danny, one last thing. If I put caulking around that square of wood that I put up in there, that should be insulative enough to keep that moisture from coming through, correct? Yeah, that's a good point that I didn't mention. I would certainly do that once you get it in place, then just go ahead and just put um, you know plenty of caulk all the way around that perimeter so that you're still not getting any, of, any chance for that moisture to migrate through. Excellent. Hey, thank you guys. And I'm going to do something you wouldn't do, Danny. I'm going up there now while it's nice and cool instead of waiting until it's 105 degrees outside. <laughs> well, you're smart to do that because that was no fun in that attic at 100 plus degrees. And you know, so you got good. a girl girl there so don't treat her like a man <laughs> well you you need to talk to her about how she picks on me all the time that's what happens see so <laughs> thank you so much guys. Well, Remy, thanks so thank you hey thanks so much for being with us here on the show as well as watching the television show and hope we can help you again Remy. you take care and have a great weekend <laughs> he's just he just couldn't wait to give me a hard time on that now it's time for our podcast question of the week this one comes from bruce in massachusetts we had our 16 year old electric water heater service recently and the plumber said that we should probably replace it soon well bruce if it's 16 years old i would think so yeah he's getting close yeah <laughs> exactly he also said rather than replace it with a smaller unit we should consider upgrading to a hybrid water heater at nearly twice the cost how is a hybrid water heater different from a regular water heater and is it really that much better joe that's all 
about opinion. We can throw a few numbers in and here and there, but right. what's your basic opinion and gut approach on that? Well, first, I think the plumber was right. He's probably going to replace after 16 years. Um, but the, the main difference is a hybrid water heater is essentially an electric water heater equipped with a heat pump. So what a heat pump does in any fashion, in this case, what it's doing is it's capturing heat from the room air and transferring it to the cold water that's entering the water heater. So the idea is the water's coming in really cold, you introduce some of this room air and it warms it up. So the electric heating elements inside the water heater, they don't have to work as hard and so they're using less energy. That, that's basically what a hybrid water heater is. And the result, um, they're more than twice as efficient as far as burning, in this case, electricity. And they say the average cost, I think last time I checked this, the average cost to operate a regular water heater is about five hundred and thirty to five hundred and fifty dollars a year, where a hybrid would cost about two hundred to two hundred twenty-five. So it's considerable savings. But that raises a question: Okay, if it's cost me twice as much to buy the unit, and I'm going to save about half of my electric bill to produce hot water, how long is it going to take me to recoup the cost of the unit? And I guess that depends on how much water you're using, how big a house you have, what you're paying for water in your region. So the question is. Should he upgrade? If he has the money in his budget, I guess he should. Yeah, I mean, it's a more efficient unit. Certainly can be more efficient no matter what he puts in. It can be more efficient than a 16-year-old electric right. water well, heater. Well, that's the thing. You know, if you buy a middle-grade water heater and you replace your 16-year-old one, right away you're saving money on the energy that's bill right. and, yeah. and and start comp- you're, you're starting to compensate yourself for the expense that you had in your home. Um I mean, I think you're you're right. If you have some money laying around and you want to put it in there, it's not going to hurt, and it will save you money if you're really looking at the you know the the, the math and when that um, return on that home improvement dollar and that water heater dollar will return on energy savings. You know, you might you might be looking at um, six or eight years before it breaks even. But then after that, of course, you you benefit from the savings. So um, that would be a hard one. Uh, I I would tend to to say just go with a good quality tanked water heater and do everything right in order to save water any way you can. And uh, you probably come out just fine on that. So always a little bit of an opinion when you have something like that. Hey, we've, if you've got a question for us, why don't you send it to us right now? Today's homeowner.com slash podcast. Right now, we're going to head to Illinois. Steve is on the line. Steve, how are you doing? And tell us what's going on with your house there. I've had a, my wife and I are the same house for uh, a little better than 50 years. About 45 years ago, it, uh, we had it covered with room siding. And it started, oh, probably five or more years ago, it started having some yellow stains uh, kind of running down the sides. And uh, we contacted the people who actually did the siding for us. And um, they, told us that uh, they didn't paint siding or anything. All they did was put uh, put new siding up. So anyway, I'm just wondering if there's anything that I could do to uh, change that to or get the yellowing off. You certainly can. There's a, a couple things. First of all, you would want to try to clean it. You know, to use a trisodium phosphate, which is TSP, is something that's readily available at any um, home center or paint store. And you want to try to clean it first by by using that, just to see if you can get some of the yellow streaks. TSP, is that what you said? TSP, cleaner. Uh huh. TSP. Oh, okay. And you'd want to try that first and see, you know, you can always try it on a small area and see if it makes a difference on it. But if it is a situation, and of course with it being 45 years old, it may have uh, chalked out enough that it's not going to really make a big difference in cleaning it. Um, and you may want to consider painting it. You can you can paint it very successfully. Joe, I know this is a, a question that we've gotten in the sure. past. I've successfully painted a number of houses like that, but a little bit of process involved in it. Yeah, Steve, like any um, painting project, the prep work is the most important. What color is the siding, first of all? It's white. It's white. So you see in yellow streaks. Well, with the TSP cleaning, you might get those yellow streaks off now you get it, get it off and you're still going to have 45 year old siding on there so sure. um i suspect that you probably would want to paint it and you can you know you can just use exterior grade acrylic latex paint find one that it's compatible with metal okay and you'd want to use a satin or a flat finish yes or sheen they call it a sheen because you don't want anything too high gloss because that would be reflective in every little dimple or dent. Sure. But yeah, you can, as Danny said, you can certainly paint 
aluminum siding. I mean, the easiest thing, of course, to hire a professional, they'd come and they'd spray the whole house, and that would be quick and relatively inexpensive considering you know you have a whole house to do yeah um, but you could do it yourself if it's a small enough house but if the question is can you paint aluminum siding absolutely in fact it it holds paint really well as you've discovered so congratulations on having 45 year old aluminum siding and you found the same contractor that's pretty amazing <laughs> yeah. well yeah the contractor has been around a lot longer than that uh, but uh when you say uh paint Intended. Did you mean that you you said spray paint now? Professional would probably spray. Oh, okay. It. The, the okay. other way you can do it, they can roll it on and then back brush it lightly to take out, you know, to even out the paint. I see. Okay. But yeah, either way, it takes a lot longer, yeah. obviously, to um, roll it or brush it on. Sure. Well, I, I wouldn't be doing it myself. It's a, a two-story house. Oh, okay. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I was just a little surprised when I talked to the the guys that did it and they said, "No, we don't. We don't paint. All we do is sell. Uh, we we just sell aluminum siding." So I said, "Well, okay." I'll see. But uh, very good, very good. I'll try that, that uh, cleaner, that TCP cleaner you're talking about first and see if I can get the, some of the yellowing off. But I do know if I brush up against it, I do get some white cock-like stuff um, or chalk-like stuff on it. Right. That's exactly right. That'll come right oh, off. Okay. Yeah, the TSP will take that right off. You'll just have to see how the finish looks after that and if you're able to do that. But, Steve, thanks so much for uh, listening to us there in Springfield, Illinois, and we appreciate you being a part of the show. If we can help you any other way, let us know. Best of luck on your project, and have a great weekend. Right now, we're going to a beautiful little town, Magnolia Springs, Alabama. Mary's on the line with a little issue with metal windows. Mary, welcome to the show, and tell us all about these metal windows. These are old metal windows that crank out, and I'm trying to paint, and a lot of the old glazing is cracked and, you know, falling off. It's a mess to deal with, but I'm trying to figure out if there's an easy way to reglaze or mix with the glazing that's still good, and then paint. Well, uh, you definitely have are tackling a pretty tricky project there, one that I have done many, many times. And the easiest thing I found on it is actually to use a little disc grinder, a little small one with full face mask so that you don't have the debris hitting your face. And also, um, I probably recommend a respirator because you never know if, um, you know, any kind of lead paint or lead exposure that you would have on that. And then you basically are using that to remove as much of the loose grout that you can. And then I found grout in a caulking tube that has a little square nozzle on it. And boy, did that save a lot of time in, in utilizing that caulk to spread the um, glazing out and then of course coming back with the thin bladed putty knife it still takes an enormous amount of time and can really test your patience because after you do all of that artwork then you have to do the priming and the painting on those but that's really the only way that um, I found to move it along instead of dipping the glazing out of a quart or a gallon um, can and applying it that way. The caulking tube does pick up the pace a little bit. Um, uh, have you have you seen that or have you tried that? No, and I wondered where I could get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you, you can be able to, you can get it at, at Home Depot glazing in a tube and um it, it, you shouldn't have any problem at all in in finding that. Another trick is to make sure that it's um, nice and warm. You, you you don't necessarily want to heat it up, but make sure that the tube's at least 70 to 80 degrees, uh, you know, so put it inside for a little while, and uh, that'll help that, because um, it's pretty thick, so that'll help it to move out of there a little bit. And do I need to treat the metal windows with something before I start painting? Joe, what do you think? I wonder, you know, prior to putting the glazing on, if in, if a little bit of primer shouldn't be applied on it, because you know how bad it is because of the thermal expansion of metal, um, it can turn that caulking loose. I wonder if it would be a benefit to maybe put just a light coat of primer on that metal. Oh, absolutely. Anything, especially since this is outdoors, Mary, I'd definitely prime it. I'd even paint it if you're going to want to, I assume you're painting these. Now, the good thing about working on the metal window as opposed to a wooden window is you can be relatively aggressive where with a wooden window, I mean, too often I've seen upon reglazing old antique wooden windows, you damage the wood before you get the old glazing out. And I'll tell you something that I saw that 
worked great on removing old glazing, and maybe you could try this. Um, several years ago, I was writing quite a bit for this old house, and I was going up to Boston on a regular basis to work with the crew and photograph and write stories about whatever they were doing. And off to the side, there was a guy doing a window, he was a window restoration specialist, and he was taking the wooden sash off the house and putting him in a big steam box. And he was steaming them for several minutes. I'd never seen this before. And the steam softened up the compound, the glazing compound, which was like 100 years old, which allowed him to scrape it off much more easily. And you could do the same thing without, you don't have to build a, a box, which all you need to do is get a, a steamer. They sell steamers. It could be a wallpaper steamer or just a regular steamer. It looks like a big tea kettle almost. And you just apply steam to that. And it takes several minutes, but it will soften it up. And then you could you can scrape it out with a putty knife. Um, so that would be another way to remove it. And again, because these are metal windows, you know, you can be a little aggressive and not worry about damaging the windows because you won't. Um, but anyway, once you get all the glazing out, then yeah, I would prime it, paint it, get it as clean as you can, and then apply new glazing, either using the glazing comes in a caulking tube or what the pros typically use is a product that DAP makes and has been made for many generations. It's called DAP 33 Glazing Putty comes in a quart, it's about $10, and you just use a putty knife and apply it. One last question. Do I have to remove all the old glazing, even if some of it's still intact? Well, if it's intact and it's in, and it's not badly cracked or anything like that, you'd have to get the old paint off it, of course. Um, so no, I'd say no. If it's intact, I would not remove it. Okay. Thank you. Well, good. Hope, right, hope we've helped you out a little bit, Mary. Still a lot of work uh, ahead of you, so don't don't get discouraged <laughs> by it. And, uh, you know, have you some gloves and all of the right uh, safety gear and, and so forth. And uh, best of luck. Hope it works out well. I hope you have a great weekend as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, that is, that's a tough one there. I have... I've spent day after day grinding away on things like that. And, of course, yeah. seeing the pictures that Mary sent, uh, some pretty big windows there. So it's uh, that could be a pretty expensive thing to replace all of those. But um, if if she's diligent and if she does everything need to, that, that, that little repair project will last a long, long time. Yeah, I do. I, and I did just think of a product. I don't know if it even still exists, but it was someone had designed this thing you chuck into a drill and you hold what has a little handle on the end of it and it spins almost like a little router bit. And the idea is you just run that along and it has a little guide so it doesn't cut too deep. And that was removing the putty. I've never actually tried it. I remember writing about it just as a new product introduction many, many years ago. That might, if that still exists, that might be a good way to do it. Just chuck it into your drill and the cutter will, will just shave away that um, glazing compound. Because once it dries out, it's pretty hard. It's not like caulk. Right, exactly. You, you know, that's the thing, you know, in, in trying a few different tools like that could save you, end up saving you an entire day or so right. if you find the right thing, like the, you know, maybe a Dremel tool that's a high speed thing and, and it might even be putting a little small abrasive disc on the end of it and running down the front side of that thing. Again, I mentioned to Mary about wearing that face mask. That Boy, that face shield would be extremely important. Right. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to wear you know, the face shield like that, and uh, that's certainly one right there. It's time for a very popular part, and that's when Joe Truini, my capable co-host, shares with us yet another simple solution. Joe, tell us about this uh, sawhorse saddle. All right, Danny, here you go. To prevent sawhorses from scratching up finished pieces, you know, if you're working on a painted door or cabinet or anything like that, piece of furniture, what you can do is protect the piece by covering the sawhorses with our favorite product here at Simple Solutions, pool noodles. All right, pool noodle time. Is anybody actually using pool noodles in a pool? I'm not nah, sure anymore. Nah, there's too many other good noodles. uses for those. <laughs> That's right. We should come out with a today's homeowner branded Pools, yeah. pool noodle. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, so here's what you do. Take a, what, you have to cut it to length. And the easiest way to cut these pool noodles, by the way, is with a serrated bread knife. That's what I found works well. So you take the pool noodle, cut it to length, about an inch or so longer than the horizontal rail of the sawhorse itself. And then with utility knife, slit it lengthwise. So right, one cut all the way along the whole length, and that allows you to open it up. And then you slip it over the top of the sawhorse. It's as simple as that. And it's nice and protected. It holds, grips really tightly. It's not going to slide off. And at the end of the day, of course, you can pull off the pool noodles. And by the way, we often say, if you've got a tip that you use and like a lot, send it to us. Maybe we'll use it on the radio. And that's exactly what happened here. Tom from New York, a listener, sent in this idea. And not only did I, using it here on the radio, shot a video 
video of it, which you can go and see right now at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. And so here's another use for pool noodles. There you go. That's great. Yeah, anything that you have that's maybe a little tip that uh, an uncle, an aunt, an old friend, your grandfather shared with you that works well around the house, don't just assume that everybody else in the country knows about it. And that's why we want you to use us to share it with the Today's Homeowner community throughout the country. All you have to do, again, is you can, uh, if it's something that you can tell us uh, by leaving us a message, you can uh, pick up the phone, 800-946-4420. Call the today's homeowner hotline and let us know about it we'll share it with everybody else and you can also send it by, by email by going to today's homeowner.com slash ask it's it's always fun though joe and at some point we will be putting that uh simple solutions um book together that'd be, good. That'll, that'll yeah, be a yeah. lot of fun and there's the rumor going around that i'm mentioning a lot of pool noodle simple solutions because i'm hoping to be inducted into the pool noodle hall of fame if that happens <laughs> i will accept gracefully but that's not the main reason i'm using pool noodles all the time around the house but joe we want you to know that we support okay, that effort thank you. and we want you to win the golden pool noodle award <laughs> And and <laughs> and we'll take a picture of you with your yes. award, and uh, that, that, this will be a yeah, big day you. for you. Yeah. I hope it works. I'll invite you to the ceremony. And, and you know, um, when, you, when you look for pool noodles, it's interesting. There are some of them that are so small in diameter. Right. I that's mean, right. you know, that the, the little tiny ones, and then you've got the deluxe pool noodles. So the whole line of pool noodles. Then we talk about the designer colors. That's correct. You know, yeah. the the colors and the color of the year. The color of the year for pool noodles is is a, a kind of a pewter gray. Is that it? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I've seen some that are actually shaped like a flower. Yeah. Cut it, like, yeah, seen... cut it cross, cut it. Actually, look, it's not completely round. I'm not sure what that's for. Well, you know, we were having a little trouble with um, the little filters in our aquarium. Right. And so I'm online looking for little things to do. You know, I assume they said, line this up, do that. No. Take a pool noodle. <laughs> there you go. And, and cut about three quarters of an inch off the end of it and right. use that kind of as a sponge like wedge to wedge in behind one part of it. And so um, I did that and I put them in there and, and it helped a little bit and everything. But uh, with the vibration and everything, at some point they they floated out. Oh, yeah, of and, course. Um, yeah. I didn't bother telling my wife that I had done that, and she was so puzzled why these strange-looking <laughs> little little sponges were floating around in there. But. <laughs> but they are pretty versatile. You know, we find lots of uses for them. If you've got a question for us, why don't you send it to us right now? Today's homeowner.com slash podcast, and we really appreciate continued reviews and and all of the great comments we've been getting about the podcast. Keep them coming and let us know any way that we can help you. I'm Danny Lifford along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thanks for listening to this Today's Homeowner Podcast.